Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today for our Southern Voices Network for Peace Building event on Africa-China relations, causes of tensions, and possible pathways, a case study of Zambia. My name is Gamchurai Mute, and I am a program assistant with the Wilson Center's Africa program. On behalf of the Africa program team, I'd like to welcome you for joining us today here at the Wilson Center, and as well as those joining us online. For those joining us online via webcast and Twitter, you can follow the live tweets of today's event by following the Africa program's Twitter account, at Africa Up Close. And you can contribute to the discussion using the hashtag China in Africa, all one word. It is also my honor to introduce our three speakers today. You can find their full bios in the event program. I'll just offer a brief introduction of each speaker so we can get the discussions underway. Each speaker has been asked to offer prepa prepared remarks for eight minutes, after which we will open up the conversation for a moderated discussion led by Dr. Mande Miangwa, the director of the Africa program, with the audience. Let me now introduce our speakers. First, we have Dr. Emmanuel Matambo. He is one of the Africa program's 2019 SVNP scholars. He is a postdoctoral fellow in the College of Humanities Department of Political Science at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. His work focuses on African agency, the continent's relations with external actors, as well as Africa's role as principal architect of peace and security on the continent. Also on the panel today is Dr. Yun Zhang Park. She serves as Associate Director of the China Africa Research Initiative at the School of Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins University. She is a leading scholar in the field of China-Africa studies, and her research has focused on the dynamics of Chinese migration in Sub-Saharan Africa. She also has affiliations with Rhodes University in South Africa and Georgetown University here in Washington, DC. Our third panelist is Dr. Patrick W. Quirk, he is the Senior Director of the Center for Global Impact at the International Republic Republican Institute. He is also a non-resident fellow at Brookings Institution and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. He previously worked at the Department of State and served as the lead advisor for Fragile States, Conflict and Stabilization and Foreign Service Assistance on the policy planning staff in the Office of the Secretary of State. Thank you so much to our three speakers for accepting our invitation. And now to introduce the Southern Voices Network for Peace Building and help set the stage for our discussion today, I now invite Dr. Mande Miangwa, the director of the Africa program, to start the session. Thank you. Thank you, Gamu. You did a wonderful job of introducing our speakers and welcoming our guests to this event. So I wish to join Gamu in welcoming all of you to the Wilson Center and to this event. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, it was chartered by Congress as official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. We take pride in the fact that the center is a nation's key nonpartisan forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. The Africa program supports the Wilson Center's mission by working to address the most critical issues facing Africa and US-Africa relations, by working to build mutually beneficial US-Africa relations, and working to increase knowledge and understanding about Africa in the United States. Today's event, being held under the banner of the Southern Voices Network for Peace Building, falls into that category. The Southern Voices Network for Peace Building was established in 2011 with the support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. It is a continent-wide network for African policy, research, and academic organizations that work with the Wilson Center's Africa program to bring African knowledge and perspectives to inform US, African, and international policy on peace building in Africa. One of the main components of the Southern Voices Network for Peace Building is a research scholarship program whereby scholars from African member organizations are hosted by the Africa program for a three-month-long resident, residence research uh, scholarship 
to work on an issue related to peace building in Africa and to interact with policymakers and subject matter experts in Washington on their research topic. Today's event will feature one of our 2019 SVNP scholars, Dr. Emmanuel Matambo, who was born and raised in Zambia but currently works um, in South Africa. And he is here with us at the Wilson Center working on China-Zambia relations with a focus on non-state actors. At this point, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge my colleague, Nia Kwete, who's sitting right here, who has been working with our two SVNP scholars. Thank you very much, Nia. So let me quickly just sort of set the backdrop against which our three scholars, uh, our three speakers will be uh, addressing some of the questions uh, that we have asked of them today. We all know that China's role in Africa is an important issue for Africa and for other international actors. With China's rise to global prominence, it has also greatly expanded and deepened its ties with the African continent, which are particularly noticeable in the economic space where China is Africa's leading economic and trade partner. But we also see China working in other arenas, including uh, in the security realm. While there have been benefits to this engagement, there are also growing questions about China's motivations and some of the risks that the approach might pose for some countries, including the indebtedness of a number of African countries to the Chinese government. Another issue that we have noticed in looking back at the work that's being done on China is that while much has been written about China-Africa relations at the state level, very little has been focused on China-Africa relations at the non-state level. That is a critical element that we need to be thinking about, which is why we're really uh, pleased to host this event today. The increasing number of Chinese citizens migrating to Africa is adding another layer to the continent's engagement with, to China's engagement with Africa well beyond state-to-state -state relations. In some countries, there's an emergence of tensions among Chinese and African citizens. Against this backdrop of increased state level and non-state actor interactions between China and Africa, we also see a rise in fears of renewed great power competition and influence in Africa. In fact, I hear some of my African colleagues talking about a Cold War Part Two. this time China versus the United States in Africa, which is something that they are not looking forward to. We see many of these issues in display in Zambia. The, the country has a long history of engagement with China, much of it positive historically. However, as Zambia's debt to China grows and as Chinese migrants enter economic and social spaces previously reserved for Zambians, there is increasing tension and skepticism over China's role in the country. And so Dr. Matambo is going to help us um, look at that issue today. So our speakers today have been asked to address a different dimension of the issues that I have uh, raised. They will look very broadly at the evolving Africa-China relations and focus a little bit more in depth at state level relations to unpack, oh, sorry, non-state level relations to unpack growing Chinese migration to Africa. They will assess the tone and touch points of the evolving relationships between Chinese migrants and African citizens. We will look at the Zambian case study um, to look at what's happening in those non-state uh, relationships and what can be done to ease some of the tensions that our speaker sees uh, emerging from that relationship. And finally, the event will also look at how U.S. policy is engaging or plans to engage with China's growing role uh, in Africa. And we do have an excellent panel to help us address this issue. Our first speaker will be Dr. Park, whom we've asked to address the broad trajectory of Chinese migration to Africa, how the scope has changed over the past decade, and what regions of Africa have been most impacted. We've also asked her to identify whether she sees any patterns arising between Chinese migrants and local communities in their relationship, and if so, around what issues uh, is that um, relationship converging and what is the driving factors behind some of those issues? And how has the Chinese government responded to the migration of its citizens to Africa, and what some of the broader implications are for Africa-China relations? And we have also asked her, as we have the other two speakers, to offer some policy recommendations about the way forward. <laughs> 
She will be followed by Dr. Matambo, who will focus on the background to Zambia-China relations and provide us with a sense of the current dynamics of Zambia-China relations at the level of individual citizens. We have also asked him to map out the rising tensions between Zambians and Chinese migrants and to highlight some of the driving factors um, behind those tensions and then as well to offer some policy recommendations. And as I mentioned previously, there is an international dimension to all of this. All of you know that last year the United States unveiled its national security strategy for Africa and that China was at the center of that strategy. So our final, but certainly not the least of our speakers this morning, will be Dr. Cork. He is not a government official and therefore does not speak for the U.S. government, but he has been working this issue for a while. And we have asked him to give us a sense of U.S. policy towards Africa as relates to China's growing role, to discuss some of the key uh, anchors of that policy and why and if at all Chinese migration to Africa fits into that policy. And also we've asked him to offer some uh, recommendations for the way forward. With that, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Park. Thank you so much. Um, and, um, and I'm so pleased to finally have a chance to meet you. I was uh, shocked to um, learn that she's actually been here for five years. I remember when she first arrived and I put it on my notebook. I'm as contact her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm very, very happy to be here. And um, as I mentioned to her earlier, um, I'm so thrilled that the Wilson Center is actually doing something um, on China Africa that is focused at the non-state level. Um, this has been my own area of, in, of research for um, over a dozen years now, and um, it's very exciting to see it being brought um, to kind of uh, Washington DC audiences. Um, I only have eight minutes, so I'm gonna go get right into it. Um, there have been um, a handful of countries in Africa that have been host to small populations of ethnic Chinese since the late 1800s. Some of you might be surprised to hear that, but South Africa, which is um, my country of focus, um, there have been uh, small uh, numbers of Chinese who have been there since the 1880s and 1890s, um, immediately after the discovery of gold and diamonds in that country. Um, Mauritius, Mozambique, Zimbabwe also have small populations that are now multi-generational Chinese Africans. Um, Ghana and a number of other West African countries have been host to uh, handfuls of Chinese families since the 1960s. But significant numbers of Chinese only started migrating to Africa in the late 1990s and into the 2000s. These flows of Chinese out of China are the result of changes in China and Chinese opening. Um, they are kind of, if you, think, if you think of it as a trajectory, kind of the tail end of um, earlier flows of out-migration from China to the West, to the United States, to Australia, Canada, and Europe. Um, one of the um, motivating factors, I think, were tightening visa restrictions in the post-9-11 era in those countries that um, forced Chinese who were looking for opportunities elsewhere to start looking at um, developing countries so, um, and, and regions. So the former Soviet states, um, countries in Eastern Europe, uh, Latin America, and Africa started receiving increasing numbers of Chinese migrants um, in um, post-9-11 era, okay? Um, in Africa, no one knows exactly how many Chinese um, there are. Um, the number that has been tossed around most frequently is around a million. Um, I saw recently um, notes that it might be about 1.2, 1.3 million um, at this stage. Nobody really knows because one of the things that most African countries are dismal at is collecting numbers. Um, uh, my research on Chinese in Southern Africa indicates that the largest numbers are still in South Africa. Um, at last count, these figures ranged at around 350,000, um, plus minus. Um, other countries that have significant populations of Chinese include Ethiopia, Angola, Kenya, Nigeria, and Zambia. Um, that said, Every single African country, whether or not they have relations officially with China or not, and actually at this stage only Swatini, or formerly known as Swaziland, um, is the last holdout in terms of uh, um, having a relationship with Taiwan um, rather than the PRC. Um, every single African country has 
handfuls, um, maybe up in the few hundreds, some into the thousands, um, some larger numbers of Chinese in those countries. Um, what's important to note um, is that as compared to the earlier migrations of Chinese um, that uh, we saw in the West in the 19th and early 20th, 20th century, is that today, Chinese migrants come from across China. In um, previous eras, um, Chinese came almost exclusively from three southern Chinese states, uh, Guangzhou, Zhejiang, um, and um, uh, Fujian. Um, today, almost every single province in China or every single territory in China has people who are leaving um, and, and moving across the globe. Um, the other difference really is that uh, Chinese um, migrants today include um, increasing numbers of women and children. Um, and I think the third thing to note is that um, there are people from various um, kind of uh, uh, educational levels, classes, who are also leaving China. So um, again, in, in earlier flows, you had kind of rural peasants, um, people who were coming to work um, in the United States in the railways and the mines. Um, and these, th this has changed. The flows from China um, are much more diverse. Um, in Africa, it's also important to keep in mind that um, a significant pro pro proportion of the Chinese on the continent are not immigrants in the sense that most Americans understand immigration. Um, there are large numbers of Chinese contract workers um, who can be found in, especially in places where there are large numbers of Chinese construction firms and Chinese mining firms in particular. Uh, these are um, workers who are on one, typically one to two to three year contracts. Um, they're um, in, they live on in closed compounds, and they have to leave at the end of those um, work stays. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to them in a second. In terms of the key um, areas of tension between uh, Chinese people um, on the continent um, and locals, um, the areas of tension um, surround several um, issues. Jobs, labor, um, the related language and cultural differences um, and tensions arising from that, from competition or perceived competition, and this would be particularly relevant in the retail sector, um, and then crime, crimes committed both by and against Chinese nationals. Um, let me take these in turn. Um, when, when Chinese and Chinese firms start, first started appearing um, in Africa, there were lots of complaints that Chinese were bringing Chinese workers. Um, now, most of you who look at Africa know that one of the biggest issues on the continent is, um, is unemployment. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Chinese workers being brought in to uh, push wheelbarrows or lay bricks is hugely problematic. Um, this was true in certain countries, um, in certain industries, um, but it has changed. It has changed tremendously, um, and almost all of the research that's coming out um, around uh, job issues uh, indicates that Chinese um, firms are creating jobs in Africa, creating a lot more jobs than um, are being taken up by Chinese people. The few Chinese, um, the few African countries where there are still large numbers of Chinese workers are in places like the DRC and Angola where you still have skill shortages and where Chinese um, companies will argue that they just don't have, um, the local populations don't have the skills that are required to finish up um, projects that, that they need to do. Or in instances where um, the Chinese firm has signed some sort of contract with an African government that has a very short time frame um, to complete a project. And, and those instances, um, the Chinese will bring in their own workers to quickly finish up something, in part because they know that they can't force African laborers to work 24-7 and get the job done. Um, that um, leads to my next point. Um, in terms of labor issues, when Chinese firms create jobs, um, these are often deemed to be inferior to other jobs that exist in the country. Chinese pay low wages, Chinese demand long hours, um, they are notoriously anti-union, um, and in short, they're bad employers. 
um, Human Rights Watch came out with a report at one stage looking at um, mining in uh, Zambia um, in the Copper Belt. And they concluded, without doing any comparative research at all, that Chinese were the worst employers. Um, anyone who's familiar with mining um, and, and copper mining in general would, will know that mining is horrible. It, these are terrible jobs, regardless of who the employers are. Um, and in fact, during um, the downturn of copper prices, the Chinese-owned um, firms were the only ones that r remained open and kept um, local Zambians employed, whereas others um, shut down their doors. Um, a book that came out last year by Chin Kwan Lee, C.K. Lee, uh, focuses on um, mining and construction in Zambia and is a wonderful, wonderful kind of ethnographic, analytical uh, work that actually does comparative analysis both across sectors, across time, um, and looking at um, not only Chinese um, mine um, owners, but also others, um, including South African, Indian, Australian. So um, labor is and continues to be an issue with Chinese firms, but um, one of the things that I've noted um, just looking at Chinese Africa, China Africa literature over the last decade is that the Chinese, both at state level but also at firm level, have all been on a very steep learning curve, and the problems that are identified um, seem to be um, addressed. The fourth issue is competition. Um, competition from Chinese um, moving into African uh, spaces, especially around retail. Um, this creates um, a lot of, of tension. Chinese firms are outbidding, are, are out-competing or underbidding um, locals, and this has caused problems. And then there are legal issues. Um, Chinese who are entering countries um, as tourists and overstaying. Um, environmental impacts of some of um, the more illicit or illegal activities that Chinese have been involved in, um, uh, as well as Chinese being victims. In South Africa, one of the biggest problems is that um, the rumor started that Chinese are willing to pay bribes, and so they're constantly targeted by crooked police officers and, um, and um, officials um, for bribes. Um, and there is um, clearly an unwillingness on the part of some government officials to actually enforce laws when it comes to Chinese because they think China is um, a, a good friend, a good partner. They want more investment from China. From, from China. And so kind of desires of, of the state and state officials on one level end up impacting and, and kind of the messaging coming down from on high about China and the Chinese. Um, kind of creates these these uh, situations where, again, in Lesotho in particular, um, there's just a, a, a level of lawlessness and bribery and corruption that um, infiltrates all of the engagements uh, or many of the engagements between Chinese and Africans. Um, I didn't even get to my last two points, um, but um, in terms of how the government has responded, um, all of my interviews with government, Chinese government officials in African countries um, has been very similar. They typically kind of do this when it comes to Chinese migrants in those countries, right? Um, they have very little control over independent migrants. Um, it's a headache for them. The only time that they have any kind of regular engagement is if uh, the Chinese migrant has gotten themselves into trouble. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to note when we talk about these things is that um, we tend to talk about China in Africa. So we've already said Africa is 54 different countries with different interests, different histories with China. China itself is also not monolithic. The Chinese state is present, but there are also Chinese state-owned enterprises, Chinese private sector. Um, and independent Chinese migrants are a force unto themselves. They go out and do what they want. They don't often have any relationship to Beijing. Um, they don't care. Um, and they're there to try to make a living and make a profit, maybe send some money home. Um, I want to maybe end with this, is that much of this has changed. The ground on Africa with Chinese migrants is um, changing in South Africa you have now a population of Chinese nationals who have been on the continent for almost two decades, right? These are now no longer Chinese, but they're Chinese South Africans. Um, regardless of actual citizenship, 
they have vested interests in the country. They are reinvesting their money in the country. They are concerned about issues. There's a court case going on right now um, about anti-Chinese um, hate speech, um, and it's a court case um, where um, 12 white South Africans posted uh, horrible, um, very racist comments about getting the Chinese out of the country in response to uh, an episode of a documentary show called Carte Blanche that was focused mm -hmm. on donkey hides, right? Um, this is one of the first instances um, where you see the, the, the kind of inklings of the formation of a, of a, a, a kind of pan-Chinese identity, including Chinese South Africans, Taiwanese um, South Africans, and mainland Chinese um, who have been in the country a long time and who are affected by um, racism and discrimination in the country. So there's uh, kind of um, more and more Chinese African marriages and children. There are more professional Chinese who are moving to the continent who are concerned about the perception of China and, um, and the ways in which Chinese firms have behaved in the past who want to serve as bridge builders. Um, and there are Chinese who've now been on the continent for quite a long time, and in terms of their own identity, probably identify more with their new homes in Africa than with what's going on in China. So I'll leave it at that and answer questions later. Thank you, Dr. Park. I really appreciate that. A lot of information in there, and I'm, I'm looking forward to delving in it in more detail once we get to the Q&A. Dr. Matambo, over to you. Zambia-China relations. Thank you very much. So I'm looking at um, the relationship between Zambia and China. I particularly chose Zambia because naturally I'm Zambian, so I have an inclination towards that. And that is Zambia on the projected there. A lot of zealous and patriotic Zambians usually say Africa looks like an expectant mother with Zambia as a fetus, or <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign of uh, optimism, good things to come, but also it's a sign of fragility. So my 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 um, characterization of Zambia-China relationship will tend to assume some of those characteristics there. One of, uh, one of the other reasons why I chose Zambia is that it has one of the most fascinating relationship with, um, between China and any other African country. The relationship was established on 29th of October 1964. That was just five days after Zambia gained its independence. And then it was also in, um, in talks between Chairman Mao of China and Zambia's first president, Kenneth Kaunda, that Chairman Mao came up with his famous Three Worlds Theory on the 9th of February in 1974. So those are just some of the, s s some of the intriguing dynamics of Zambia-China relationship. And of course, it was in Zambia that China, pr uh, that China sponsored one of its most expensive projects, the Tanzania-Zambia railway line in 1969, it started in 1969 up to 1974, and that was a time when China's GDP was three times less than the GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa at $156 against Sub-Saharan Africa's $490. And then in com and Zambia and China, Zambia and Tanzania had actually approached uh, the West to um, aid on that particular, particular project there but then uh, they did not succeed. And that is the line of the Tanzania-Zambia railway line. So Zambia is surrounded by eight countries. And at the time that it got independence, four of those countries were under colonial or settler rule. Angola and, Nami uh, and Mozambique were under Portuguese colonialism. Namibia was under South Africa and Zimbabwe was under Ian Smith's um, uh, in, uh, regime in, in Zimbabwe there. So after gaining independence, Zambia was implacably against colonialism. And Ian Smith used to blackmail Zambia by closing the border, and that was the only sea route that Zambia had. So the Tazara provided a lifeline for Zambia, and it was a, uh, it was a need both ideologically and uh, economically. So for China to actually tell President Nyerere of Tanzania that as the Chinese, we are going to suspend our immediate needs and help you to build this railway line. And they sponsored 400, more than $400 million. So that was such a munificent de demonstration of China's uh, kinship with Africa's, uh, China's identity with Africa's problems as well with against colonialism. So that bred what has been called a lingering sense of gratitude on, on Zambians. But then one should also note that for three decades, since 1964 when Zambia gained independence to the early 2000s, Zambia-China relationship 
the Zambian relationship was consigned mostly to the level of state-to-state -state interaction. Even the people who came, the more than 50,000 people to some est uh, estimates who came to build the Tanzania Zamba rail line because China did not, did not put the money at the disposal of Zambia, it also added personnel. Almost all those had to go back to China at the termination of their contract. But then in the 1990s, when Kaunda left government in Zambia and Frederick Chiruba came, started liberalizing the economy, that created space for foreign investors to come and occupy certain economic sectors of Zambia. And that also coincided in the late 1990s with Jiang Zemin's going out policy where now uh, Chinese uh, were incentivized by the government to go out. And that now uh, quickened up the burgeoning numbers of non-state actors from, from Zambia. And that has introduced the new dimension now to Zambia-China relations. It was not only state-to-state -state relations, it was only also at a subnational level uh, of interaction. Dr. Park calls it the downstairs dimension of uh, Africa-China relations. So my main point is that the tension that has um, latterly infected Zambia-China relations at subnational level is mostly because of identity. When relations were consigned to the level of state, China was had that identity of a country that is uh, committed to to fighting uh, colonialism and and minority rule in Zambia, and also Ch Kaunda described China as an all-weather friend of Zambia. So that is the relation. That is the identity that was there. But then now, latterly, the government of Zambia does not enjoy the monopoly of crafting and constructing identities of Chinese. To a lot of Zambians now, China presents itself in the Chinese people that they interact with on a daily basis. And Howard French has said something profound to say, the Chinese who are now coming to Zambia as non-state actors will do more to determine China's image and perhaps China's broad relationship with the continent. And with that, I would like to go against the myth that the Chinese who are coming to Africa are part of uh, this grand scheme by the Chinese government. Most of them come out of their personal volition, ambition, and they pursue their own interests. And with that, they assume a different identity of China that might not be consonant with the identity that China seeks to present as a government. What are the main tensions? The tension comes mostly because, partly because of uh, the value system. The Ch Chinese people usually vilify Zambians, for example, especially those that work for them, for saying uh, Zambians do not have their priorities in order. They are very poor, but every weekend they want to clean up, go to church, and not come to work. So they vilify that, saying, are you going to eat the Lord Jesus Christ, for example? But Zambians will say, no, we want, we want to reserve Saturday for rest and Sunday for church. So those are just some of the tensions that come up. One of the tensions of another thing is the um, political opportunism by political players, especially in Zambia. Michael Chilifiasata has been credited with bringing Zambia into the political center of, uh, uh, of campaigns in Zambia and so on and so forth. And his, the identity that he projected of China is that China is an investor rather than an investor. And that uh, not only that, the Chinese are trying to transform Zambia into a semi-colony of, uh, of China of some sort. And in an environment where the economy has been growing in Zambia, but then it hasn't percolated to benefit individual Zambians. For example, youth unemployment, especially if you include the potential labor force in Zambia, is, goes up to 48%. So if someone tells you that your problems are caused by an outsider, you obviously seize on to that. Just like, for example, in South Africa, xenophobic attacks usually happen in Alexandria where unemployment is alarmingly high. So that, that, that identity of China as an investor, Chinese as abusers, has actually been uh, partly to, bl to blame on this um, anti-Chinese sentiment in Zambia. And then another thing is that there are these fears of uh, a return to col colonial rule. You know, when someone tells you these are going to uh, take over Zambia, as Sata said, there are those fears that uh, tend to creep in into, into Zambia. And of course, economic pressure, as I said, the lack of transforming, transforming the, the Zambia's economy. And then what could be done now in order to lessen uh, this tension? One of the things that the Zambian government should do is look at the issue of land. There are Chinese nationals today who are venturing into small-scale farming, some into commercial farming, but then 
their tenancy of land is usually negotiated with headmen. Now, that is not in tandem with the Land Act of 1995, which says if you're a foreign national wanting tenancy of land, you should have an investment permit, and you negotiate that with the minister, with, with, the, with the Zambian portfolio expressly created for that. So the government could do well in order to, uh, to tackle that question there. Another thing is that if they are coming, if a Chinese national is coming with an investment permit, well, ostensibly for investment, then their economic activity should be confined to an industrial level. You don't want to see someone selling vegetables, tomatoes, and, st and stuff like that. And that also applies to gambling, which is an issue that hasn't caused violence yet, but it might cause violence because it is already cause causing a lot of consternation because there is a lot of small-scale gambling in Zambia happening under the auspices of the Chinese. And Zambia has considered that to be morally corrupting because, first of all, these gambling machines are all over. They are in taverns, they are outside shops, and it is not easy to regulate who, who takes part in gambling. There have been cases of underage gambling. So if all that is consigned to the industrial level, then there could be a way of monitoring that particular activity. Another thing that the government could, could do in, concern, in concert with the Chinese government is to make sure that they broaden the mandate of the Confucius Institute, a vehicle through which the Chinese government seeks to promote Chinese language and culture. If you want cultural fusion, then it has to be a two-way thing. It should not be Zambians only learning the Chinese language and Chinese culture in Zambia. It could be Chinese nationals as well learning the Zambian culture. And some of the things that I said, like, for example, the days and hours of work and stuff like that, could be undermined when the Chinese are also integrated into the Zambian culture. And for the Chinese government as well, it has now... The time, I believe, has come where the policy of non-interference non has to be revised. At a national level, this policy is a very endearing characteristic, especially for objectionable African governments, who are virtually given a blank check from a dependable donor to do as they please. So there have to be, Africa has to be held to accountable. We do not have to hold it to a... To, it is patronizing to think that Afri Af African governments should be held to a different standard. They can do as they please. So China has probably to revise the policy of non-interference. To the non-state level, as I said, to the state level, it is a blank check of, um, of, of misrule in Africa. To political analysts, it is actually a political charade because if you actually dig deeper, you realize that non-interference is not as sacrosanct as the Chinese government would want us to see. To non-state actors, to subnational actors, the policy of non-interference is a fiendish disregard for their human rights. Because then China is implicitly saying, well, even if your government is abusing you, even if your government is, is, is abusive, we do not care about that as long as we have this semblance of cordiality with it as a state level. China should realize that, yes, in as much as it is not sponsoring this this incursion of Chinese nationals into Africa, its image will be dented if its people are not well received by African citizens. So those are just some of the things that uh, could be done. And of course, track two diplomacy. Track two diplomacy is a, is a type of diplomacy that is expressly aimed at subnational levels of diplomacy because China is no longer a monolithic whole in China. It is no longer the China as a state. It is also China as it manifests itself through individual Chinese who are venturing into the continent. I thank you very much. Oh. All right, Dr. Matambo, you just preempted my two minutes to wrap up note that was coming your way, but thank you so much for that. A lot of richness uh, in your uh, presentation as, as well. Let me now turn it over to Dr. Quirk to sort of uh, give us that international dimension focusing on the U.S. Uh, yeah. government in particular. What does all of this mean for U.S. policy towards Africa? Perfect. Well, thanks very much to the Wilson Center Africa Program for the invitation to be here with these very distinguished speakers. I've consulted all of your work in my own scholarship, my time in government, so pleased to put a face with a, a name. My name again is Patrick Quirk. I'm the Senior Director of the Center for Global Impact at the International Republic Institute. Just a few words about IRI that give you better ideas to the perspective we share that informs remarks today. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization committed to advancing freedom and democracy worldwide. 
Working with our partners, we accomplish this overall mission through targeted assistance that links people with our governments, guides politicians to be responsive to citizens, and motivates people to engage in political processes. We've conducted high impact work in more than 100 countries since 1983, currently have offices in 40 countries worldwide, and work in 25 countries or regions across Africa. This includes working with USAID in Nigeria to strengthen political parties, as well as with support from the NED and the Sahel to address some of the socioeconomic drivers of conflict. Related to the topic at hand today, we recently wrapped up a comprehensive study of Chinese interference in 13 countries across the globe, which I'm happy to talk offline after this event. So Dr. Muyangwe asked me to address two key issues. First, to outline the broad contours of what U.S. policy toward Africa is as it relates to Chinese engagement on the continent. And second, to discuss what else, if anything, the United States could do to help implement the China-focused aspects of this policy and thereby maximize effectiveness. So let's begin with that U.S. policy. As you all know well, the 2017 U.S. national security strategy made very clear that great power competition is the primary ordering principle for U.S. foreign policy under the Trump administration. And it is largely, and no doubt wholly, through this lens that you, the U.S. views challenges and opportunities on the continent. This is highlighted quite clearly in the 2018 U.S. Africa strategy, which categorizes China's, quote, predatory practices on the continent as direct threats to U.S. interests. Per this policy, China's, quote, opaque trade deals, strategic use of debt, and bribes endanger U.S. interests because they stunt economic growth, threaten the financial independence of African nations, inhibit opportunities for U.S. investments, interfere with military operations, so on and so forth. As outlined in the strategy, the U.S. is undertaking two initiatives, among others, to address these perceived threats. First, expanding its economic relationships in the region through Prosper Africa, which aims to support U.S. investment across the continent, among other objectives. And second, encouraging African leaders to choose transparent and sustainable foreign investment projects. Implied here is that the leaders should not choose opaque deals on offer from China. With that very stylized summary in place, let's move to how the strategy could perhaps be uh, enhanced. Public intellectual scholars have debated the strengths and weaknesses of the U.S.-Africa strategy. It's certainly not my place to relitigate re those arguments here. What I can offer, though, based on IRI's perspective, is a few thoughts that the U.S. might consider as it works to implement the China-related pillars of its Africa policy. This essentially involves coupling the current U.S. focus on economics with an increase in democracy assistance. So why is this called for and how does it align with the existing strategy? Intensifying U.S. assistance to bolster governance on the continent is required because the strength of democracy in places where the United States and China are competing will very likely be a key determinant of the competition's results. Authoritarian countries are more vulnerable to Beijing's coercion or co-optation because their regimes are less constrained by independent media, free elections, and other institutional checks that would otherwise control against such subversion. And in this space, as you all well know, we face a daunting challenge. Over the last decade, democracy has declined globally while the ranks of authoritarian states have swelled. The IRI research I mentioned earlier confirmed that China indeed is exploiting or at least in some cases indirectly exacerbating these democratic weaknesses and target states to advance its interests. This includes various countries across sub-Saharan Africa. In Zambia, the case study for today, for example, Chinese government-backed loans have caused the country's debt to balloon to somewhere between 9.5 or 10.6 billion. Increased Chinese media influence and rising corruption have exacerbated the tilt toward authoritarianism in Zambia. Given these trends and their consequences, the U.S. really should couple its focus on economics and make democracy assistance a central component of its strategy for prevailing against China. This should involve using foreign aid to help make countries more resilient to CCP coercion and hand-in-hand -hand with diplomacy, ch championing the superiority of liberal democracy to China's authoritarian option. To chart this path forward, the U.S. can look to the past for effective democracy assistance approaches, many of which have been pioneered and supported by the likes of USAID and the NED. Two examples clearly stand out amongst others. First, U.S. foreign aid programs have strengthened the capacity of civil society actors to uncover corruption, increase transparency, and hold leaders accountable. Similar programs could serve as a check against Chinese malign influence if the United States deploys them and countries vulnerable to CCP coercion and tailors them to the local context 
and needs. Second, US-funded trainings can enhance foreign journalists' understanding of critical journalism skills and inculcate a belief in them that reporters play a critical watchdog role in society. If the U.S. expands and targets these programs in countries vulnerable to Chinese coercion and, again, tailors them to the local context, they could help increase transparency as a check against opaque deals and the associated expansion of CCP influence. Like the citizen diplomacy exchange programs that the U.S. State Department supports, these initiatives, again, civil society strengthening, support to independent journalism, also have the added benefit of demonstrating the strengths of participatory governance and how it is superior to China's authoritarian uh, approach. In closing, I want to note that this is not a call for the U.S. to reverse democratic deficits in all nations vulnerable to CCP coercion. It is, however, a recommendation to work with its partners hand in hand in the region to shore up some critical governance gaps and thereby complicate Beijing's efforts to expand its influence. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Quirk. I think three very um, important contributions to our debate and discussion and thinking through China's engagement uh, in Africa. I was going to ask the panelists some questions, but I'm sure you all have uh, a lot of questions. So let me just establish some quick ground rules for engagement. Those of you who've, known he who've been here before know exactly what those are. But for the benefit of those of you who are visiting us for the first time, um, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hands. I'll take three questions at a time. Identify yourself, the institution with which you're affiliated, if any. Identify the speaker to whom you're addressing the question, and then you have a minute to make a comment or ask a question. And so with that, the floor is open. Uh, just wait uh, for us to get a mic to you before you ask your question or make your comment. All right, so I'll start right there. And then I'll come over to me over here. Did I see a third hand? And then I'll come over to the gentleman over there, and then I'll take the next round of questions. All right, sir. Franklin Moore. Um, for Dr. Park and Dr. Mutombo. And you're uh, with Africa, right? No. No? No. OK. Independent these days. Oh, all right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> um, my specific question is on one group and the degree to which research has been done on them, and it's contract workers. Has there been research done that looks at just contract workers and makes a determination on the number who have stayed past contract versus those who have gone back to China at the end of contracts? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you have the next one right here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Nia Quete. I'm also an independent consultant. Um, and Dr. Park, um, your survey of um, Chinese communities across Africa is fascinating, and you mentioned some of the things. But um, I was wondering if, in looking at them, you noticed the issue of um, of uh, gambling, because it's, it's been an issue in Ghana as well. And um, Dr. Quirk, um, about injecting democracy, you as using democracy as its uh, competitive advantage. I was wondering if you see a role, as I do, for the U.S. to draw on its large community of um, people of African descent in this country. I mean, this, this huge number, can it be used to help um, strengthen democracy in Africa? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Kennedy. I'm also independent. Uh, my question concerns the political and socioeconomic um, incentives, both for Chinese migrants to come to Africa outside of, say, the, the larger firms. And are there incentives that have been put in place by the Chinese government to help facilitate this? Are there growing structures or in, within the countries and within Africa itself to provide avenues for citizenship? for Chinese nationals that migrate to Africa. So if, as Dr. Park had mentioned, there are approximately 350,000 Chinese living in South Africa. Do Are many of those expected to become citizens of South, South Africa? Um, and so that, that would be my such a question. All right, Dr. Park, I think you're in the spotlight. Over to you. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Moore, um, in terms of contract, um, sorry, in terms of contract workers, um, the um, CARI, um, where I work, the China Africa Research Initiative, has a small database that has numbers of um, Chinese contract workers. To my knowledge, there is no research that focuses on contract workers broadly across the continent. Um, there are a number of smaller studies that look at um, individual countries, um, and again, um, countries like Angola um, and the DRC um, and um, in West Africa where there have been um, kind of large um, oil projects, for example, um, would have um, significant numbers of, um, of Chinese contract workers. Um, in terms of the transition from contract working to becoming independent migrants, that is a phenomena that has been identified, but because of the sp specific visas under which most contract workers are brought in, they all need to go back to China. Okay, some, some number of them, and it's a small percentage, uh, manage to return to Africa because they've seen that there are um, opportunities. They see, they've seen that they can invest perhaps and become their own boss of a small business um, with a very small investment. Um, but this, um, in terms of that transition between contract workers and um, independent migrants, um, from, from my reading, it's been a fairly small percentage, and it's typically the managers at the managerial level where people have some access to um, funding, to um, funds that they can then um, um, collect in China and then return to Africa to make some sort of investment. And almost every Chinese migrant that I've um, interviewed, and I've interviewed hundreds of them um, over the decade, um, in southern Africa, so across South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, um, Namibia, um, almost every single one of them has gone into debt in order to travel to Africa to become a self-employed kind of entrepreneur. Um, many of them end up um, doing work that they never did before in China. They were employees of some company. They were, um, you know, engineers. They were. Um, I interviewed uh, one um, gentleman who was indeed kind of a, a, an astrophysicist or a scientist of, of some note in um, China, and he was selling women's lingerie in Johannesburg and able to make a lot more money doing that so that he could um, send his children to good schools. Um, and it was all um, typical of many of us who are our first generation immigrants, um, the same kinds of motivation to create a better life for their children um, was, was, was it. Um, in terms of um, uh, Professor Quete's uh, question about gambling, um, it's certainly something that in South Africa I had noted, but um, to my knowledge, no one's done any research on this topic. Um, and again, um, I left South Africa in 2010 when we moved back to the States. I haven't been back um, in the field um, so much. So um, this was, uh, to me, when I looked at casinos and gambling, it was a potential site to do research on the Chinese migrants um, as a problem. Um, the way um, Emmanuel mentioned as well in Zambia, um, I had not seen that. So I think this is perhaps a new phenomenon that would require further study. Um, and um, Tom Kennedy, in terms of, of your question, um, so for independent Chinese migrants, there are no um, kind of incentives um, th that are offered by African countries or that are offered by Chinese um, to move to Africa. Um, there, there's no government involvement. In fact, when I hear things like that, it reminds me of um, similar comments that were made um, about Koreans in um, uh, shops throughout D.C., L.A., New York, right, that they must be getting money from the government in order to become so successful. There's no state-sponsored funding or incentive scheme uh, for Chinese to move. Um, most of the Chinese individuals who um, I've interviewed um, talk about um, the extreme competition um, of living in China, um, of trying to move ahead, of uh, finding jobs. Um, and interestingly, the one thing that almost every person I've interviewed um, in South Africa talked about is that you can breathe the air in Johannesburg or um, Cape Town. Um, there are no huge crowds. The sky is blue. So those kind of 
quality of life issues um, played a big role in why they stayed, not necessarily in why they moved. I mean, they moved, again, like I said, in order to um, find opportunities to make a better life for themselves. Um, the, the second part of your question about the road to citizenship, um, it's not easy, um, in part because China doesn't allow for dual citizenship, and in most African countries, um, there, uh, there are no smooth paths to citizenship. It's very different for Chinese nationals than it was for Taiwanese. During the apartheid era, um, the, the apartheid government had um, specific programs to incentivize Taiwanese to move to South Africa to um, invest in the former homeland areas in order to create jobs to keep black people from urbanizing and moving to the cities and becoming politicized, right? The Taiwanese, because of the specific relationship that at, the, at, that at the time Taiwan had with the um, apartheid government, were allowed to take dual citizenship. And so many of them became South African citizens. Um, the situation changed drastically when um, South Africa recognized the PRC um, and, uh, and derecognized Taiwan. Um, Two thirds of the Taiwanese who had taken South African citizenship left the country. So. I, I've written about this. This leads, leads to all sorts of questions about the value of a passport, right, and what really motivates people. So I guess to me the, the, the juxtaposition is they might not have national citizenship, but they're very embedded in, in life in South Africa. They've, they've made money. They've reinvested profits, and they've reinvested again. They're moving from being sm small shopkeepers to... Um, being property developers or um, investing in, in mines locally and, and in um, construction and in buying shopping malls um, and things like that. So there, there is a commitment and an investment, and they're becoming localized um, in various ways, but very few of them that I've interviewed have become citizens of those African countries um, f because of problems on both sides um, and, and lack of the opportunity to become dual citizens. Thank you. Patrick, you want to comment on the question um, sure. on um, the role of the African diaspora in advancing the democracy agenda in Africa? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, look, providers of U.S. assistance already endeavor and do a good job of ensuring the broadest range of persp uh, perspectives already support the assistance they provide. I think equally important is that any aid or programming is designed hand-in-hand -hand with local partners and communities to best meet their needs in addition to advancing U.S. interests. So there's certainly a role for the diaspora, but I think the, the aid community already does quite a good job of ensuring that a diverse set of perspectives informs the design of assistance and how it's provided. Thank you. Let me take another round of questions. I'll start right over there. Let me take this corner over here, and then I'll come to that corner over there. So the three people in the triangle over here. I'll start with Greg back there, and then the gentleman in front. Okay, um, Greg Simpkins, USAID. I have two quick questions. One is, uh, what's the current status of um, seizure of Zambian uh, natural uh, national assets to repay Chinese debt? Um, and also, you, you have uh, talked about the differences between uh, Chinese individuals and the Chinese government. Um, to, to what extent are they, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Park, that um, they're often more loyal to their current home than they are to China. Um, how widespread is this dissonance between Chinese living in Africa and the Chinese government? Thank you. The gentleman right in front of him. Right here. Until, uh, Can you get the mic? Until late 2017, I was the American ambassador to Zambia. Um, so my question is really more for Dr. Matambo, but I think it involves all of them. It, my impression from three and a half years in Zambia is that the U.S. and, uh, and China have very different assistance models for the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we used to say that, our, that the U.S. assistance model was... Uh, which is substantial. I mean, it was on the order of about $500 million a year. It's 90% um, for health and 90% of that for PEPFAR. Uh, China, on the other hand, all of their assistance is primarily project assistance. They don't really provide direct assistance to the government. Uh, I would make the, uh, the argument that really 
both models uh, have not served the interests of the Zambian people. Um, I kind of uh, agreed with Elias Chipimo, who used to say that what, uh, what Zambia really needed was a PEPFAR for education. Uh, if we had been spending $500 million educating uh, young Zambians, the economy would be doing better, the society would be doing better, and the democracy would be doing better. So that's my question. Do you, would you agree with Elias, essentially? Thank you, Ambassador Schutz. I didn't recognize you there for a minute, um, but, but thank you for coming. <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is uh, Ken Myers. I'm on the adjunct faculty of economics at American University. And in a previous incarnation, I was the IMF's resident representative in Zambia. Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking you, Dr. Muyangwa, for sponsoring this forum this morning. Um, and I'd like to address um, mainly Dr. Matambo. Um, my, my assessment is that in Zambia's case, they've been mostly reactive in their relationship with Zambia. And that reflects the fact that Zambia is about 18 million people and China's 1.3 billion. Um, so their uh, relationship has reflected that imbalance in the power between the two countries. And I'm just wondering, if Zambia, instead of being reactive, and I suppose this would go on, um, be the same for other countries in Africa, if they had a strategy about how they were going to approach not only China but other foreign powers, if they had a strategy about how they were going to approach them and what they were going to try and achieve and having a concrete relationship with those countries, um, how would they um, design that and what would they try and achieve by doing that? So three really good questions, actually four, because Craig's was two-pronged. Um, I think the first two for you, or were for you, um, Emmanuel, uh, the status of Zambian seizure of assets to repay Chinese debt. Uh, we all know that Zambia is on the precipice of falling into yet uh, more debt, uh, just as it was back in the 1980s, which would be a really sad development. And then the other question was on the loyalty of the Chinese um, <coughs> citizens, uh, that bifurcation there, and, and, and what's being done on it. And then Ambassador Schultz's question, I think, uh, again to you, uh, Emmanuel, on a PEPFA for education, which I happen to uh, agree with, but mm -hmm. I think certain politicians, not just in Zambia, but I think across the continent, are afraid of an educated citizenry, but that's a whole other issue. Mm. Uh, and then the Zambia question from uh, the gentleman who was at IMF, reactive, how do we get Zambia, the Zambian government, and any of you can respond to that, the Zambian government to move from being uh, reactive to being more proactive in developing a strategy. So let me start with you, Emmanuel, and then I'll just swing around uh, to all the other speakers. Thank you very much, um, Greg, to start with your, to start with your question. Well, there, there has been a lot of controversy that China threatens to take over uh, Zambia's state-owned enterprises. Now, it, that could happen, but it is against the law unless, of course, the Zambian government decides, for example, to privatize, then people can sell. But you cannot use, the Zambian government cannot use a state asset as collateral in a deal. But, of course, those rumors have been inflamed by, um, uh, especially the opposition in Zambia, because the Zambian government has also been culpable actually in, in, in promoting uh, those particular kind of rumors. For example, just recently it decided to unilaterally um, liquidate Konkola Copper Mine, which is, uh, which is the biggest employer. And, and, and it's owned by Vendetta and uh, with, from India with 20% of the Zambian government having a stake in that. And a lot of people are saying, well, that is another way of trying to bring China into the, into the mainstream of mining in Zambia. But it cannot be done through the channels of negotiating loans. So the fears are there, but not as the people think they're going to happen, as though we're going to forfeit our debt and then China gets the, the state assets. But it might happen through some underhanded means, such as a backdoor privatization or liquidation of some sort. And then um, Ambassador Schultz, uh, 
I agree as well. That is why I said um, China has to revise the policy of non-interference because it is a myopic policy. It is only there, for example, to pacify African governments, especially those that are that are errant. So, investing in education is something that is, of course, it's a long-term thing. But once you start reaping the benefits of education, they are more sustainable than just uh, all these loans that are more project-based because. A lot of it, and project-based investment appeals more to people who cannot see way beyond what. If a Zambian who could not travel on a tarmac yesterday today can travel on a tarmac, they will say, "Okay, this is development," without knowing exactly how sustainable that particular development is. So, prioritizing education would actually be better for the long-term benefits, and it would actually be more of a of a sustainable legacy that China could leave and the United States as well. I'm, I'm thankful that you were frank about uh, that particular thing as well. And then when it comes to the Zambian government being reactive, well, probably my, my question would be reactive to who? Because when it comes to Zambian to, 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 to China-Zambia relations, the government has been very pliant, actually. Mm-hmm. Zambian citizens have been more focused against China. The Zambian government always... Uh, always succumbs to to China. Like last year, for example, two weeks after the forum on China-Africa cooperation, when the rumors that Greg talked about, when the rumors of China taking over state assets happened, Zambians went to the streets and there was a lot of unrest for about two weeks. The Zambian government came and said, no, it's, it's a lie that China threatens to uh, take these things up. So the Zambian government has been very pliant. But in terms of what proactive up approach could the Zambian government come up with? Um, this is an awkward question because this is a non-partisan uh, thing, but what I would say is this. The, the, the most dependable actors would be the civil society and opposition leaders because the Zambian government is already in cahoots. 33% of our debt right now is owed to China. Nelson Mandela used to, pl- used to say you cannot play tough with your banker. So uh, in, in when you look at the Zambian government in that particular thing, I don't think it would be very proactive, especially in instituting policies that would be maybe inimical to China's uh, interests in Zambia. So one of the things would be activism that uh, promotes a responsive and a morally defensible sort of policy from China. And that, of course, will inadvertently will uh, automatically entail having a more activist foreign policy that imba- uh, that that promotes uh, good governance on the part of Zambia as well. So I think that's a very polite and diplomatic way of saying if we are looking for a more cohesive, forward-leaning strategy for Zambia engaging China, we shouldn't look to the state, at least not right now. So, is that okay? <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Um, I just want to quickly talk about the um, the question about um, differences between Chinese in China or China and um, Chinese migrants in um, in Africa. Um, m- maybe there was a slight misunderstanding of one of the things I said because I don't think all Chinese in Africa are more loyal to Africa than China. Um, I, my argument was that there are Chinese who have been on the continent now for 10 years, for 20 years. Those individuals probably have the same sorts of identity um, issues, conflicts, you know, of, of where. And, and, and one of the things that I've looked at um, from the time I started my PhD was this question of where is home. Um, and I think maybe in terms of migration studies, in terms of identity, what we start need to start looking at for many of us in the room, I think, who have our hearts in places where we no longer live, right, is this idea of multiple homes. And I think this is something that many Chinese migrants who are in Africa, but elsewhere in the world as well, overseas Chinese, grapple with, right? Um, th- th- where I live now is home, but do I have any loyalties to China? And if I do, is it to Beijing? Not likely. It's to your idea of what home is. So I think, the, the, um, again, this issue of kind of equating the Chinese state with Chinese people is problematic because it's not just the Chinese state. You have the Chinese state. You have Chinese state-owned enterprises, some of which are um, national, but many of which are provincial, right? So there are provincial construction companies, right, that are state-owned. They have a much 
um, more tenuous link to Beijing than, than the state-owned, uh, for example, national oil companies, right? Um, and then you have Chinese contract workers, uh, Chinese immigrants, um, migrants. Con um, there's, there's a whole range. And, and this question of loyalty to China, what does that even mean? It doesn't mean that they promote kind of Beijing's policies. China is huge. Somebody mentioned the population. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to talk about all Chinese being more loyal to one place or another. And I think in this day and age with uh, um, access to social media, um, I think um, I've argued in, in one of my papers, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of grappling with this idea of how social media impacts identity and, and kind of localization, right? Because on the one hand, Chinese are, you know, are making investments and buying houses and sending their children to schools in South Africa. But on the other hand, they still have um, kind of daily, sometimes weekly, sometimes daily conversations with their family in, in China, right? The connections are still there. Um, how that plays out at the end, um, you know, let's, let's talk about this in a generation. Um, I think in some ways this, we're, we're, we're still very kind of early on. And I think maybe um, one of the directions we could look at, um, we're talking about this earlier, is um, if you're not a black African, can you be African? I mean, this is a question I think that white South Africans grapple with, that um, people from the Indian subcontinent in East Africa, people from um, Lebanese heritage in, in West Africa um, deal with, right? And, and this is a question that I think has a lot to do with African national identity construction projects. Um, so that's it. I wanted to just briefly talk about this whole question about which African countries have any kind of leverage. Um, there are recent studies that have come out um, that look at Angola and the three countries that have managed to leverage much uh, better deals with China. Um, and I do think that Zambia, if the Zambian government cared to, um, could leverage their historical relationship with China. And, and, and um, you know, we mentioned this as well um, b before this talk, that in some ways, because of the history of Chinese engagement with Zambia, because of Tanzania, Zambia Railway, that relationship is almost seen as sacrosanct and is very important for China. There are ways that African countries could find elements of the relationship, you know, whether it's the um, existence of oil or other minerals that China needs to leverage these relationships. So it's possible. Several countries have done it, um, but whether or not there's a political will to, um, to, 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 to create a better relationship that will benefit the people of that country is really a question about African governments more than about China. Thank you, Patrick. Do you have anything to add to this, or shall I take another round? I can go for another round. I'll, I'll take another round. Okay, but let me just, I know this is it might get me into trouble, but I just want to uh, tag on to uh, Ambassador Schultz's uh, earlier comment. I, I, for me, the question of uh, education is critical, fundamental to Africa's future. And I, it's not just about African governments prioritizing it. As I look across administrations in this country, at where education has uh, fit in to our engagement with Africa, I see a huge deficit there as well. And so what can we do on this end to elevate uh, that particular issue and embed it much more comprehensively and to a scope that would allow us to see the sort of progress uh, that we are looking for, I think is a fundamental uh, question that we need to ask ourselves uh, as well. And then just to be provocative, very quickly before I take the next round of questions, uh, you asked, you, you know, what color are Africans? Africans <laughs> come in all colors. <laughs> That's my position. Let me take the next round of questions. Um, I'll take the lady over here, and then I'll come to the gentleman over here, and then the gentleman in the back over there. I'll come to you in the next round. Okay, thank you very much for a very fascinating discussion so far. My name is Amaka Anku. I run the Africa team at Eurasia Group, which is a global political risk advisory firm. Um, I have three very quick questions, and I'm going to get it in under one minute, I promise. All right, let's go. <laughs> um, so the first one is just to close the loop on something that you've, you've talked about already, Dr. Park, which is that 
um, the different Chinese citizens are migrating for various personal reasons. Um, I guess I just want to get your view on what is some has become somewhat conventional wisdom. You know, Howard French talks about that there was a deliberate policy of encouraging migration to Africa, whether or not it came with an incentives like you know would you say, then say that that is was an in, is an inaccurate um sort of assertion to make i guess that's my first question um second question is what if any and this is i would say either dr park or motambo can jump in on this one what in your view if any do you see as the potential impact of us china tensions, which is starting with trade, but is is inevitably going to morph into sort of more ideological clash um, on Africa, right? So when Dr. Munda started, she mentioned something, you know, that there's beginning to be grumbles of, of Cold War number two. Um, you know, do you see, whether it's for, bad, for positive or negative, what impact could this have um, on the continent going forward, in your view, right? Um, and then the third quick quick question is, you talked about, I mean, I happen to agree with you that Zambia in particular has, um, has a lot of leverage with China. It's become the poster child for the so-called debt entrapment that the US talks about, even though, frankly, if you look across the continent, um, there are not a lot of countries in that position, right? I mean, Zambia is, really stands out. Even even in Kenya, Kenya's external debt is probably 20% China, right? Um, and at other places, it's really small. So, so it, it, you know, with that context, it does have, China should theoretically have a strong interest in not seeing Zambia fail. Because then it's like, well, this is exactly what we were talking about, right? So in that, we, with that context, do we have any update as to whether and why Zambia will be able to maybe renegotiate some of its loans that are coming due in a few years with China? And if that is, if there's any progress on that discussion. Thank you. All right. So that was three questions that you snuck in there. I'm going to be really strict from now on. I just need one question from each person. So we can give our wonderful speakers here the opportunity to respond. Uh, those, the gentleman right here, sorry. Uh, thanks, Nicholas Cook at the Congressional Research Service. Uh, Dr. Qu uh, Quirk, could you uh, talk about what you mean when you use the term Chinese coercion, um, ideally with uh, an example in Zambia, and if not, maybe Africa more generally? Um, and then could the two other speakers address the question of, of racism? Uh, in the, the Zambian-Chinese relationship. I mean, Michael Sata was vitriolic uh, in his criticism of China as a candidate, but then he made, made was very friendly once in power. Uh, similarly, President Lungu last year made a, a, a very unfortunate racist joke calling uh, Chinese like cockroaches, saying they're everywhere. Um, and yet, two days later, was went to a signing with a, a, a major company. Um, so if you could talk to that issue in the construction of the relationship. Thanks. Sorry, Nicholas. I'm having a hard time recognizing people today. Thank you. Um. Uh, thank you. Uh, Johannes Kassahun from the Institute for Economic Growth and Legal Reform. Uh, I have only one question, and that is uh, the question which I would like I mean, to draw uh, the attention that uh, the ambassador made, that the, uh, all of a sudden we are getting into two modes of investment that is going on into Africa. One is a traditional OECD, US-based type of looking at uh, long-term investment on health education. The other one is the uh, Chinese model, which looks at what people can see. There's something which is project, as, as it was called. And this project issue is becoming a kind of a threat like we are being kicked out. That is not necessarily uh, the country, the, the, the recipient country's approach because they need, I mean, the, the investment I've seen, I mean, in, 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 in different countries where people are benefiting out of that. We cannot just, I mean, dismiss it. On the other hand, what is the capacity to negotiate? What is the institutional strength? Which I, my question is directed to Patrick, where 
whether U.S. aid or U.S. policy is changing a little bit in making these countries institutionally strong. One case, an example. Okay. Procurement. Uh, okay. Please. Just I mean in that procurement systems, like for example, institutional uh, strengths of uh, these countries determine whether they can negotiate a better deal with Chinese or any other company. Yeah. So look, the, the, the question is an important question. I didn't mean to cut you off. What you, you're really talking about is that there is uh, the strategic uh, level of negotiating, and then there's a the technical ability and the mm -hmm. capacity to be able to negotiate. What can partners and those interested in helping Africa do to help build some of that uh, technical ability that would allow uh, African countries to negotiate fairer deals or whatever with the Chinese. So I, I get you, and it is an important question because the lack of capacity, uh, particularly in the civil service, yeah. uh, in many African countries is a key issue. There is no running away from that. Absolutely. So here's what I'm going to do. We have 154. We have, uh, sorry, we have, a, a, or we have, Six minutes? Six minutes to bring this to a close. Can't answer all of the questions. What I would like to do is to give each of you a minute and a half to pick on some of the questions that have been asked uh, so that we can bring this to a close and hopefully you can make yourself available to meet with uh, some of the audience members for a few minutes following the event. And so with that, let me start with you, Patrick, and then sure. bring it in. Yeah, Nicholas, good to see you. To answer your question, I'm happy to share the report that we put out a few months ago, which has a lot more fine-grained detail. But wave top level, what does CCP coercion look like? I mean, one, pressing unfavorable deals behind closed doors. This is coercion of those leaders, maybe, maybe not, but it is a coercion of the people in those countries. That's arguable. And then second, purchasing journalists and in some cases media outlets and pushing them to put out China-friendly coverage, arguably also coercion. So the gentleman's question in the back, is U.S. policy changing even slightly to focus more on institutional strengthening? I think I would argue USAID has for a very long time focused on the importance of strengthening institutions. If we're talking about ways in which we could tweak assistance and policy moving forward, are there ways in which to strengthen institutions and citizen capacity to better monitor how these deals are being negotiated? Perhaps. I think that's something worth exploring. Thank you. Um, whenever I come to events about Chinese migration, I hope there's um, kind of not going to be a question about Howard French's book, but inevitably it comes up. Um, he is a great storyteller and a raconteur, and the um, stories that he's told in the in the middle of his book are great. His argument that he starts the book with at the beginning and the end um, are nonsense. Um, he's arguing that Chinese migrants, these individuals that we've been talking about today, are at the forefront of Chinese um, imperial kind of move into the continent, and I find that to be nonsensical, um, especially having interviewed as many individual Chinese migrants as I have. And he, I mean, if you actually read the content of his stories, he basically argues the same thing, but um, perhaps in part this had to do with um, the funding for his research project. Um, so, no, I don't agree with um, his argument um, about Chinese um, kind of Chinese migrants being kind of part of China's push into Africa. Um, I just wanted to touch quickly on the question about um, debt trap and um, and and kind of the the comment that was made. Um, there there is China is not practicing debt trap diplomacy. Um, China is uh, giving loans to Africa mostly to build. Um, it's for infrastructure projects. Um, and contrary to something that was said earlier um, by one of the uh, questioners, um, I do think that that's having a positive impact on Africa. This is what African leaders, African state, African elite want. If Africa is going to develop and move to the next stage, they need that infrastructure. You can't start building factories if you don't have electricity, right? So infrastructure is, is the main thing that Chinese firms and Chinese government loans have been supporting. I think that's a good thing. The problem of debt burdens is a different question. Um, at the China Africa Research Initiative, we um, collect information on Chinese loans to Africa. What gets published in the newspapers um, often is um, are, are highly exaggerated numbers based on announcements that are made. Um, most of you who work on the continent realize that 
after the announcement, if you actually track it, maybe a tenth of that amount is actually invested or loaned, um, right? And loans that are made is not the same as debt. Most African countries, number one, uh, the debt is owned by multilateral institutions, not by China. In a handful of countries, China is the largest individual um, financier. Um, many countries who've taken loans have been able to, to, to pay for them, right? Um, and when we talk about these issues, I think it's important to note what these loans are being made for, right? Um, and um, Kerry is starting to look at um, kind of debt forgiveness and debt restructuring. This is all kind of a newer research, so we haven't um, been able to publish anything along those lines yet. But China has been very forgiving. Um, a number of, of African countries, particularly those countries that they think are um, important partners, there's been um, several episodes of loan forgiveness, and China has also been much more willing to um, renegotiate loan terms um, and, and the length of, of loans. So I think it's important to keep all of those things in mind. Um. Thank you. Just before you conclude, um, Atambo, I think I, I'm, I'm you just said something really uh, interesting that I think we, we're going to have to follow up. Obviously, there is a looming debt crisis in some African countries. Uh, what I think I hear you saying is we need to do a better job of unpacking this looming debt crisis to really get at what are the key drivers of the debt crisis and that we may be attributing more to China than uh, is actually uh, the case. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I think it's going to differ from country to country, but I, I have heard you uh, on that one. And I'll give it over to Matambo, but very quickly, I just got a text about my comment on um, Africans come in all colors. I, I do believe that. Uh, you cannot divorce the issue of citizenship from Africa's complicated history. And for the Africans in the audience and online, you will know that where your umbilical cord is buried matters. For whatever reason. And so I stand by that. We can have another discussion about what the responsibilities of citizenship are. Mm -hmm. Those are related but different questions. We can also have a discussion about those who take off when African countries get into trouble. Are they real citizens? Mm -hmm. We can have that discussion, absolutely. But I, I think we would be doing ourselves a huge disservice if we looked at Africa only as being those of us who are black. You negate the continent's entire history, complicated as it is, painful as it has sometimes been. And so I will leave it right there, but I wanted to take a moment to respond to the question that I just got. Matambo, African agency is important, so you go last. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amaka talked about the possible adverse and positive effects of the U.S.-China trade war. Uh, first of all, it has had some adverse effects, and the Zambian uh, finance minister talked about that. And one reason why it has been so adverse is that uh, intra-African trade is very limited. It's only about 12%. Now, with, signing, with the signing of the African Continental Free Trade Area, we have this ambitious um, uh, goal of uh, doubling that by 2030. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it will happen, but if, if, we, rel if we relied more on intra-African trade, then maybe the, that wouldn't have so much of an effect. Even uh, there are also fears about the possible adverse effects of Brexit as well, and all those emanate from the fact that there is very limited intra-African trade. And then when it comes to racism of course there are racial constructs on on chinese we have uh, pejorative names unfortunately for uh, people of asian descent we just call them the same name uh, based on what we think they sound like so the, 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 those constructs have have been there but whether or not the occasion of violence that usually manifests in uh, africa china relations is a cause of racism i would be very reluctant to 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 say that and then when when it comes to uh, African governments and their capacity to negotiate, in the case of Zambia, unfortunately, the situation is a bit dire because from 1964, the country still remains chronically dependent on copper. Uh, 
up to today 95% of our output is is is, is copper and, uh, and and unfortunately that limits our maneuver especially when a country comes into Zambia negotiating based on the fact that it is going to get most of the copper exports from the country so if we tackle the issues of less dependency on copper finding alternative sources of energy then maybe we could bolster our leverage at the negotiating table Fantastic. I really hate to bring this discussion to a close because I think we have, it was a very rich uh, debate. So please thank, join me in thanking our three wonderful speakers for raising some really important questions. And I, th I thank all of you for, for coming. From my perspective, this is the beginning of a much longer discussion that needs to follow different threads in how China's uh, relationship with African countries is evolving. And I hope you will join us uh, for those efforts as well as we go uh, down that, that path. Uh, thank you to the Wilson Center team and to the Africa program uh, team. Uh, you guys are fantastic as always. We appreciate everything that you, you've done. Let me just ask our speakers for a to, take, to stay on stage for a quick photo, and then they will join you outside uh, for some more mingling for those of you who want to engage with them. So thank you. All right. Thank you.